Hello, and welcome to the Totally Clinical podcast, brought to you by Techro. Totally Clinical is a deep dive into the freshest trends, big time challenges, and most excellent triumphs of clinical trials. I'm Hannah, your host. Join me as I chat with industry experts, trailblazers, thought leaders, and most importantly, the people benefiting from clinical research. So tune in, settle back, and don't touch that dial. It's time to get Totally Clinical. How do you evaluate risk in clinical research? This is a topic I'll be discussing with Jeannie Hecht of JTH Consulting, who's here to explain more about both current and future risks in the life sciences industry. During the podcast, we discuss different types of risk, how they're playing out and making industry headlines, as well as what could happen if some of these risks remain unaddressed. Welcome back, Jeannie. It's been around a year since your last appearance on the podcast. You came on to discuss sustainability and how trial efficiency can lead to a greener industry approach. What have you been up to in the meantime? Well, it's been a really busy year, Hannah. So it's good to be back. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and your listeners. It seems like the industry, um, as well as myself, continues to work at a breakneck pace. I've been enjoying the journey and supporting a number of different companies as they grow and deal with growth-related challenges, opportunities, and risks. And I've been following the news. um, And you think about what's going on in the news right now. Is there a recession? Is there not? Um, What about what happened with the Silicon Valley Bank and the reverberation that that's going to put across the global economy? And probably the sleepless nights it gave to many CEOs, CFOs, and investors and uh, small and mid-sized companies within our space. Uh, I've been keeping my ear to the market uh, to look for industry trends that can cause companies to either soar or trip up. So that's been a lot of what's been keeping me busy these days. So today we're going to discuss the topic of risk in clinical research. Just to start off, could you explain how risk is evaluated in the industry? So many companies have a formalized risk management program, and some companies do it more in an informal uh, manner. When I think about my role on many different boards of directors, that is a key function of the board of directors, is to be evaluating the risk um, exposure of an organization, as well as opportunities where in the industry risk is creating new paths for growth. When we think about risk management, simply put, a company conducting risk management is looking at which risks they can avoid which risks they should mitigate or lessen, and which of those risks they can absorb. And this all uh, funnels into an organization's annual and probably three-year strategic plan. We can look at this with a lens on ourselves and think about those risks we're willing to take versus those we're not willing to take. So for example, if you've got a big meeting tomorrow, do you want to stay up late tonight um, watching your favorite TV show? Or do you want to get a good night's rest so you can do your optimal performance? Many companies in our industry evaluate risks using a matrix, and they rank um, specific risks based on likelihood of occurrence. They rank them on degree of impact. And they categorize, categorize typically those risks into a couple of different buckets. So financial risk, operational risk, customer risk, or regulatory risk. Maybe some might use their own or use different ones than that, but that's typically what I've seen. So risks that impact financial metrics or performance of an organization, there are the risks, um, there's then there's the risks that affect a company and how it delivers um, its goods or services to the market. Those are your operational risks. Risks to customer engagement, so customer satisfaction uh, or customer delivery. Those are the risks that typically get bucketed under a customer risk. And then obviously risks to regulatory compliance. So if the FDA... Um, issues a new regulation? Are you following that regulation or are you choosing not to? And then what are the potential downstream impacts of not following that risk or that regulation? Um, What could that risk lead to? And so that's how companies often look at risks um, at the corporate level. Great. Thank you for explaining that in greater detail. If we think about the clinical trials industry or clinical research industry, are there any specific examples that you can think of that represent how risk can play out in the industry? 
Well, we'll start first with the one that's at, at the forefront, which is the Silicon Valley Bank. And when you think about what happened with them in overnight, that many companies did not have more than $250,000 in operating cash, that could present a substantial risk to our industry. So that's a lot of biotechs, healthcare IT, um, as well as other types of companies that support our industry lost their operating cash overnight. So that means how are they going to pay their staff? How are they going to pay their vendors and suppliers? Are they going to keep the lights on? Now, thankfully, those types of risks, which are extremely hard to foresee, um, are having uh, different types of uh, mitigation strategies with the government stepping in to support it. When I think about some really specific clinical research risks, there's another one that's kind of front and center right now. And a few weeks back, um, Pfizer announced that they're going to stop testing a Lyme disease vaccine in roughly half of the U.S. patients. It, um, this is a late stage study. The patients had been recruited and the company said they were citing, it was citing a breach of clinical trial guidelines by the third party contractor. That's a major issue. And while the um, information is still coming to light, that's a regulatory risk that one organization chose to absorb that regulatory risk. That then led to now a customer issue and a potential financial risk for that organization, that third party contractor that um, was recruiting and treating these patients. The, um, you know, this could, you know, impact a large number of patient population, um, pa patient participants across the industry. And while this was being delivered, the study was being delivered in a non-traditional, a new model, um, a hybrid model, uh, decentralized model. In this instance, you know, there is a potential risk then that the market will start to feel as it relates to decentralized or hybrid trials or new models for how operational delivery is being executed at our research sites or the types of partners that are involved. It might mean that companies, customers are less risk um, tolerant and that they wanna continue to stay with traditional models for clinical trial execution. It could also mean that um, some of the providers that currently support new models of delivery feel um, and risks associated with market uptake and therefore revenue generation um, could be realized and they could start to feel some softness in that area. So only time will tell, but that's one risk that I, another risk that I see currently impacting the industry. Yes, it's interesting because there's been so much talk of decentralized trials and people really have different opinions on it. I, for one, have always been a supporter of it because I think of a ways in which we can make the clinical trial process easier for the participants that we need to support the advancements of medication and treatment options for patients who need that, anything we can do to speed up the process. And our industry is notorious for taking a long time um, to implement new technologies. And that often has uh, a direct correlation to the need to take risk to zero. And so I don't want to see this negatively impact our ability to advance new possible ways of delivering clinical trials because there's too many patients that are counting on it. Another risk that springs to mind for me is the risk posed by recruitment problems, both patients and staff. So recently in the UK, there's been a review commissioned looking into the decline in trials. There's been a 44% reduction in recruitment from 2017 to 21. Um, and listeners will also know, I've had some really interesting conversations recently on the subject of site staff burnout and how to solve it. Uh, this is clearly a huge risk affecting the operation of trials. What are your thoughts on this? You know, whenever an industry has a challenge with workforce, it can create substantial issues for the overall industry. And we clearly do that the challenges with having experienced staff who understand the regulations, understand the nuance of engaging a, part, a patient who wants to become a participant in a clinical trial, understanding how um, the logistics management works of executing a clinical trial successfully at a research site, and on up through the various um, paths within the industry. Anytime that that person at what I like to call the sharp end is affected or the people down there are affected, 
is the hardest. It's going to be felt throughout the industry. And when we, you can't pick up an industry trade journal these days without, or attend a conference without hearing firsthand about resource challenges. And it's all over. And I know that ACRP has been um, issuing a lot of details and uh, in, and reports regarding that. Um, and I spend some time working with Wake Forest University and the University of North Carolina, both here local to me, on the kind of business of health and the need to continue to grow uh, resource pools to support this business of health. I think we're at a real tipping point again, um, and it's where either we're going to have enough resources to continue to deliver and there's enough groups um, investing in growing and advancing these resources, or we're going to continue to have resource challenges that that means that that could create other opportunities for other companies. And com people have to then make the hard decision. If I don't have enough resources, does that lead to a regulatory risk? Does it lead to a patient care risk, i.e. an operational risk? And, and or if it does, are the risks too great to continue or are there ways in which I could mitigate the possible likelihood of occurrence or the impact of those risks? Also, as we're seeing, this resource shortage is leading to um, you know, trial delays and trial start delays or programs being shelved. And that, again, has a long-term impact on the patients that are counting on new, new possible treatment or care options. So, again, how can we become more efficient and or how do we help the industry um, address and solve this resource challenge that is more than just an issue at, you know, Dr. Taylor's site or at X, Y, and Z company? Yes, it certainly is a multifaceted issue. I mean, we've had guests on this podcast who've discussed how to resolve this very problem. Uh, you mentioned universities there. I spoke with Perla Nunes recently of nonprofit Greater Gift about their scholarship program on how to encourage a new generation of leaders from diverse backgrounds. Also last year, I chatted with the co-founders of Latinos in Clinical Research, who went into greater detail about the urgency for more resources to train staff. So operational risks clearly pose a big threat. A lot of people are aware of this. And perhaps this is actually a big ask, but I'd like to discuss what kind of risks you feel are more imminent than others. I know it can be hard to predict the future, but could you explain a bit more about this? Yeah, I think what I just talked about, the challenge and the risks of a lack of resources is critical. I mean, think about this in a sense of an agricultural perspective. If we didn't have enough farmers to tend the lands, we could have a, a food shortage, right? And so when we think about our business, we're not in a highly automated, um, we don't operate in a highly automated way. We are reticent to bring technology on that could drive efficiency in our processes. We're highly fragmented. Um, many of our technologies don't talk to one another. And at that same point in time, um, there hasn't been a substantial push by um, and support from the industry to really try to drive the resource challenge at the technical level or the collegiate level or the university level. And as a result, um, we have challenges with generating this new pool of resources. I mean, there are a couple training grounds, at least in this area, for new research professionals. I mentioned Wake Forest Universities. They've got a master's of clinical research program. We have Durham Tech here that supports with an associate degrees program. I know the ACRP is um, has their kind of certification training programs there's e-learning companies like Proficiency that are centered on a mission to help train competent leaders and really using simula simulation-based training and uh, competency-based training to do so. Um, we have technology companies like TechRo and Versatrial working to improve efficiency of our clinical research teams at that site level. But again, we for a long time in the industry have ignored the challenges that are affecting at our sites. We just figured that they would overcome them themselves. And that's a thinking that has to um, be modified. 
because it's all boats will rise if we all work together. We can't just try to push problems down within the industry. Um, and we, in the industry, I'll put a challenge out there to pharma and biotech that we've got this arbitrary ruler about years of experience. And I, for one, know you can take somebody with two years of experience or 20 years of experience, and you might actually find that the person with two years of experience or less is com more committed and passionate about the work that they're doing and is more eager to learn and be trained than perhaps somebody with 20 years. That's not a, di a dig on the 20-year person, but it's the fact that we've arbitrarily assume that some, somebody is just fresh out of school or only has a year, year and a half or two years of training that they couldn't possibly be as good um, in a highly regulated, highly controlled environment as somebody who has 20 years of experience. And I'd like to challenge our thinking on that. If we continue, and if we don't, if we don't challenge our thinking and we continue to further down that path, we'll continue to see a further decline in the pace of which our trials um, uh, come to uh, the, you know, come to be executed at our research sites, and that will continue to inhibit the availability of possible life-altering medications to the patients in need. So since as an industry, we constantly talk about patient centricity, we should really be looking at um, the resource challenges that are inhibiting our ability to be actually truly patient-centric. So there's a real message there to the industry. There needs to be more of an open mind about how many years people have been working in the industry. So moving forward, how can we better manage risk generally? Do you have any thoughts on industry-wide shifts that need to be implemented? Well, Ken Getz, um, who I simply adore, uh, and his team at Tufts presented some scary statistics last year about the length of process that it takes to do vendor qualifications and also um, the length of process that it takes to um, launch new technologies. And while I know it's harder to tell customers that they need to move faster in that process, I'd like to put a challenge out there that surely we can do better than the, you know, one plus to three plus years that it's taking to fully adopt or even just implement uh, a new technology. The same point in time, the time it takes and the, the expense it takes um, in the vendor qualification process is something I'd love to see the industry make substantial movements on. So those would be uh, what I'd like to recommend that we focus on next. Yeah, it's kind of strange how fast our world is in every other area, yet clinical research seems not to have adapted. I couldn't agree more. I think it's um, a challenge for each and every one of us to no longer be okay with the status quo. We need to constantly be looking within and looking externally to what we and others can be doing better to advance clinical research. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jeannie, to discuss the subject of risk in clinical research. It was simply my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And that's your dose of Totally Clinical. For all the listeners out there, you can follow Tecra on LinkedIn and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, download the Totally Clinical podcast on Apple, Spotify and Google. See you on your next visit and remember to bring your friends. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.